Let's just offer a, another word of prayer before we begin and ask the Lord to please us. Father in heaven, we are thankful that on this Sabbath day, you brought us together to uh, give to us so many Sabbath blessings. It is on this day that you meet with your people in a special way. Amen. You open the windows of heaven to pour down blessings upon us. Amen. You are busier on this day than on any other day of the week because in a special way, your people make more demands on you on this day than any other day of the week. And so, Lord, we, we covet the blessings that you had for us this morning, and we pray that through your Spirit you will be with us and that you will bless us with the truth that we need for today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you weren't here for Sabbath School this morning, I uh, appreciated Brett's comments again. And you know, we didn't co we didn't uh, collude with each other. I phoned him up actually yesterday. Was it yesterday? Yeah, because uh, the. the the youth weren't ready to do a um, special feature, so I asked Brett to fill in. And uh, you know, the topic that he spoke, uh, presented to us, he just picked that yesterday, right? Yeah. Yeah. And the sermon that I have this morning, pretty much the same thing. And I heard uh, Bev said that uh, Franco's presentation at Sabbath School this morning was along the same subject. And um, you know, the way they see a message is what I wanted to present this morning and you know the Lord worked it out so that we would all harmonize with all the other speakers today and I uh, praise the Lord for that. Before I go into the sermon for this morning though, I did want to make a one statement about a, uh, a correction that I need to make for the uh, sermon I made two weeks ago. We talked about you know why does God wait? Why are we still here, right? And one of the texts I used was in um, uh, where was it? Um, first, first Timothy. They talked about the, the natural affection and the, where God says, you know, um, uh, these are the people who will be destroyed in the end. And, you know, um, uh, it, it listed among one of the characteristics, they, they are without natural affection. And I said, you know, that is talking about homosexuality. And um, uh, in the last days, we'll have more and more of that. And that is true, right? That, that is a biblical teaching. But you cannot say that from uh, 1 Timothy. Because if you look at the Greek, and, and Brett uh, uh, showed this to me, and I remember you know, um, hearing about this before too, without natural affection in that text in 1 Timothy, it's not referring to homosexuality. But actually, if you look at the Greek, it's talking about the lack of natural affection, which is a love that uh, parents have for their children, uh, children to their parents, uh, man and wife, that's natural affection that God built into us, right? But God says, in the end times, people will be without natural affection. So, uh, just wanted to make that clear, that natural, uh, without natural affection isn't talking about homosexuality in that text. But that same uh, phrase is used in, uh, in Malachi chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. And in that place, it's talking about without natural affection, in a few few uh, verses before that, uh, definitely uh, it, it is talking about homosexuality. Uh, let me just, not Malachi. Uh, Romans, Romans chapter 1, verse 31. Let me just real quick share that with you. Romans chapter 1, verse 31. It says, no, no. Oh, yeah. yeah, Romans 1.31, uh, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection. It's the exact same Greek, the exact same uh, uh, phrase there. But uh, so in that, without natural affection, that's talking about parents and children in our earthly relationships, right? But if you look just uh, a few verses before this, um, verse 26. For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And likewise also the men, verse 27, leaving the natural use of the woman burned in their lust one to one another, men with men working that which is unseemly, 
and receiving in themselves that recompense of their error, which was me. That is clearly talking about homosexuality, right? Yeah. That which is natural, turning it into an unnatural use. And so that it's e easy to you know, just automatically make that connection in our minds, but just remember that um, uh, you have to use the text in Romans, Romans 26, 27, around there, and not the uh, without natural affection. That's talking about family ties. And you know, that, uh, that um, absence of natural family affection, that is a, a mark of the last days, right? And that is why in Malachi 4, uh, 5 and 6, chapter 4, verses 5 and 6, one of the, the last day Elijah message is to bring back the thoughts of the parents to their children and the children to their parents, to their fathers. It, it singles out fathers, it? Yeah. it means parents, but it says fathers in Mal uh, Malachi chapter 4, 5 and 6. That is a part of the last day message that God has for us, bringing back that natural affection. Parents loving their children, children loving and respecting their parents. That, that's a part of the gospel message. All right, so let's go on here. I've entitled my message this morning, if you look in your bulletin, it says, Sinless Perfection. Sinless Perfection, and it has a question mark and then an exclamation point, right? And that's done on purpose because the question mark is there because it's, it's a point of controversy. And there are questions about, is sinless perfection possible in our in our lives here on this earth right now. And then the exclamation point is there because on both sides of this controversy there are strong opinions, right? And even in our church, the Seventh-day Adventist Church today, this question of sinless perfection, is it possible? Is it possible here and now? It's a huge controversy. But, you know, this this controversy over sinless perfection is exactly what um, prophecy said would happen in God's last day church. But let's make it clear. Sinless perfection, is it possible? I'll, I'll get to the conclusion in the beginning here. Is sinless perfection possible in our human state right now? Or do we have to wait until the second coming? I hope most of us, if not all of us, agree right now that this is what we need to attain right now. Sinless perfection in our lives right now. Do, do any of us have it right now? I dare say we do not. But is that what we are all working towards? Is it a possibility that God has given to us? Sinless perfection in our bodies right now. It is. And I hope we can see that uh, later on as we go on with our study here this morning. But turn your Bibles, first of all, to 1 John. 1 John, chapter 2. 1 John, chapter 2. And verse 1. 1 John, chapter 2, verse 1. 1 John, chapter 2, verse 1 says, My little children, these things write I unto you, that you, what? That you sin not. That is the will of God, right? The prophets, the apostles, all of these, all of the writers here in the Bible are writing to us so that we sin not. That is the goal that we have to reach. But John goes on, he says, And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And praise God for that. Because Amen. Amen. Any of us right now, can we say, I have not sinned this past week? Can any one of us honestly say that? No. Probably not. Probably not. Do we need to get discouraged because we sin over and over and over again? No. We don't need to get discouraged because John says, praise the Lord, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Amen. Amen. But remember, is Jesus going to be there in the heavenly sanctuary advocating for us forever? No. Through all eternity? No. no. Because his people just cannot get their act together. The this, this sermon that I did two weeks ago, why is God waiting? It's 
because his people, that's right, we have not been able to reflect the character of Jesus for them. And that has to happen before he can come again. We have to reach that state of sinless perfection before Jesus can come again. Because there's, there's coming a time when Jesus will stop advocating for us in front of the Father. It's the, he will lay down the censor, its high priestly robes, and he will come down to this earth as a mighty conqueror, as the King of kings, the Lord of lords, he will not be advocating for us in the heavenly sanctuary at that time. Amen. Probation will close. And before that time, we have to live in the sight, after that time, we have to live in the sight of a holy God without immediate. How is that going to happen? Sinless perfection in our experience. Let me read to you a, a little quotation from um, Early Writings, page 207. It says, um, I asked the meaning of the shaking I had seen. This is talking about the shaking in Adventism, right? I asked the meaning of the shaking I had seen. It was shown that it would be caused by the straight testimony called forth by the counsel of the true witness to the lay of the scenes. The shaking in Adventism, if you've studied anything about that, Ellen White says the shaking in Adventism, where we'll see leaders, we'll see you know, people who we thought oh, they are solid Adventists, we'll see those kind of people just shaken out of the church, throw away their faith. And she says it would be caused by the straight testimony called forth by the counsel of the true witness to the Laodiceans. What is she talking about? The, the counsel of the true witness to the Laodiceans. We had a foretaste, uh, uh, a teaser for this in, in what uh, Brett talked about this morning. And I understand uh, Brother Frankel brought it out in the Sabbath school. What are we talking about? The counsel of the true witness to the Laodiceans. Where is that council found? Which book of the Bible? Revelation. Revelation. Which chapter? Third chapter. Revelation chapter 3. Let's open our Bibles. Revelation chapter 3. The shaking in Adventism, in God's church, is going to be caused by the straight testimony called forth by the counsel of the true witness to the lay of the scenes. Uh, continue on in this um, quotation from early writings. This, the counsel from the true witness, will have its effect upon the heart of the receiver and will lead him to exalt the standard and pour forth the straight truth. Some will not bear this straight testimony, they will rise up against it, and this is what will cause a shaking among God's people. So this message to the Laodiceans is going to cause controversy. Some will accept it, some will rise up against it, and this is what will cause a shaking among God's people. You know what? Being raised up in a conservative St. Adventist church, and you know, we, we consider ourselves here in the Linwood Adventist Church, we consider ourselves to be a conservative <coughs> church, right? And we talk about, we have to give the straight message, the straight testimony, and we say, you know, it's going to hurt some people, but we have to give them the straight message. That straight message is aimed toward who? Is it aimed toward the world? This straight message that God is trying to give is aimed at church. His, people, no. his church, the Adventist church. And it applies not to what we would call a, well, the liberal church, liberal Adventist churches. It, it applies to them too. But even more specifically, it applies to every one of us sitting here in the pews today who consider ourselves to be good, straight, Straight message, Seventh-day Adventist people. That message strikes at us. 
Let's, I'm sure you've heard a lot of um, you know, sermons regarding the latest message to, to God's church. Um, I just recently was listening to a sermon that was given by um, a Dr. McNulty, Norman McNulty. Anyone know that name? He was a, I, I went to medical school with him, and after medical school, he, he's just a tremendous Bible student. And I don't know, I, I'm sure he has a busy medical practice, but he gives sermons all over the place on spiritual topics. He's a, a mm -hmm. wonderful um, expositor of Bible truth, and you can hear his sermons on um, audio verse. And I was uh, listening to one of his sermons there, and uh, it really blessed me. And so a lot of the thoughts that I'm going to share with you this morning uh, were initially I got from um, Norm, Norman McNulty. But let's just go through and quickly hear the, the latest message found in Revelation chapter 3, and starting with verse 14. Revelation chapter 3, verse 14, it says, Unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. And as Bible students, we know that the seven churches represent the various um, uh, ages of the God's church in the, uh, throughout the ages. And the Laodicean church is the last church that this talks about, right? And the Seventh-day Adventists are God's holy <coughs> church, and this latest message applies to each and every one of us sitting here this morning. And it says, he introdu God introduces himself, Christ introduces himself to us as the faithful and true witness. He knows what is happening in his church. You know, I'm a naturopathic physician, and you know, Dr. Norm McNulty, he's a, a, a medical doctor, and there are several people here um, involved in the medical work. If someone, if one of your patients gets a, a bad um, blood test, say you were looking for markers for cancer and you find some very high markers for cancer, are you doing your patient any favors by downplaying them and saying, oh, you know, your, your blood tests, uh, there are a few abnormalities, but uh, it's not too bad, you know, it, it'll be okay, everything will work out fine. Are you doing your patients any favor by downplaying the risks and saying, oh, everything is going to be okay, no, nothing to worry about. As a doctor, are you doing your job if you downplay the risk or, God forbid, if you misdiagnose, give the correct diagnosis and telling your patients what their true condition is, that's one of the primary um, duties of a doctor, right? If you don't do your patients any favor by saying, uh, well, you know you have high blood pressure, but everyone has high blood pressure, so you don't have anything to worry about. You're not doing that patient any favors by doing that. Your patient needs to know how serious it is. And God says to us, Christ says to us, I know your condition. I am the faithful and true witness. Listen to what I am telling you. Yeah. He's giving us the proper diagnosis. And uh, on a side note here, he also introduces himself to us as the beginning of the creation of God. The beginning of the creation of God. Now, why would, he, why would God introduce himself to this last day church, sent to Adams, as the, creation, the beginning of the creation of God? He emphasizes, I am the creator of God. I'm the one who created you. Because, in, according to prophecy, what is uh, one of the most important points of controversy that will be in the last days? The Sabbath, right? The Sabbath is directly tied to the seven days of creation, right? And God says, I am the creator God. Remember me as the creator God. Because in the last days, in the last days of this church, you have to make that clear in your mind. In the Seventh-day Adventist Church is the seven-day, literal, 24-hour day creation. Is that a point of controversy in our church? In the Seventh-day Adventist Church, is it a point of controversy? It is. How can that be? We call ourselves, it's right in our names, the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and it is, it is a point of controversy. Many of our science teachers in our universities do not believe in a 24-hour, you know, literal creation, seven-day cycle. Oh, tragic. God knew that, and he said, remember, I am 
Eu tirei do lugar. Reading on, uh, verse 15. I know thy works. I know the correct diagnosis for your condition. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would that thou art cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. That is the lukewarm condition, right? Neither cold nor hot. Uh, and then, uh, we've, all, we've all thought this, I'm sure, but, well, we're not cold, we're not hot, so we need to get, we need to get on fire for God, right? Amen. And that is true. We need more of the Holy Spirit power in our daily lives so that we can become hot for God, to become excited about what God wants us to do, and start sharing the gospel with those around us. And that is an important point. But the latency and message is so much more deeper than just that. In that verse that we just read, God says, I will spew thee out of my mouth. I will spew thee out of my mouth. That word in Greek is a male. Spew. What does it mean? Vomit. You know the um, you know what the word emetic means? What does it mean? A, a, yeah, it's a, 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 a medic medication is something that will induce vomiting. You know, so if you if you just poison or something like that, you know, they give you a medic so that you can yeah. throw back up, right? An a medic. That's what a, me, a male means to vomit. God says, I'm not just I'm, I'm not just going to you know spit you out of my mouth. You make me vomit. This is what God is saying. Your condition, your spiritual condition, he's talking to his church, the Seventh Adventist church. He says, Your spiritual condition makes me want to vomit. Is that more forceful to you than what you thought? I, I always thought, you know, uh, cold or hot, you know, the, the worst temperature of a, a drink is lukewarm. It's neither cold nor hot. You want to spit it out of your mouth. And God says, your spiritual condition makes me want to vomit. That's serious. Verse 17 says, Because thou sayest, this is why God wants to vomit. Because you say, I am rich and increased with goods, and I need of how much? Nothing. Nothing. Need of nothing. And you know not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. So this patient is delusional. <laughs> he doesn't know his own condition, right? God says you are poor, you're blind, you're naked. But what is the patient saying? Rich. I'm rich. I'm increased with goods. And I have need of Nothing. I have need of nothing. Because I am the last day church, I am God's last day church, I am a seventh day Adventist, I have my name on the church records, I understand righteousness by faith, I understand sanctification is the work of a lifetime, I understand all of these things, I worship on the Sabbath day, I eat the right foods, I dress appropriately, I am here on, in the pews every Sabbath day, I have need of nothing. And God says, your spiritual condition makes me want to fall. Mm. Because we are poor, we are blind, we are naked. When God says, um, we are poor, how many, probably not, not many of us, probably not many of us here in this room, are we rich in this world's goods? Any of us rich in this world's goods? Probably not. I certainly am not. But is this talking about worldly goods, worldly rich riches? No. It's talking about spiritual riches, right? And has God blessed this church, the Seventh Adventist Church, with spiritual riches? Yes. He has. Amen. He should be 
we should be the, the rich, spiritually richest people in all the world, right? We have the words of truth. We have the spirit of prophecy. Amen. So much spiritual riches that the Lord has given to us. And that's why we think, I am rich, I am increased with goods, and need of nothing. But God says, even though I have given you all of these riches, you are poor if you're blind. You are naked. Why is that? God has given to, given to the church all these riches, but he says you're poor. Because of what? What's that? God has given to this church abundant spiritual riches, but he says you're poor. ourselves, maybe, but no, even deeper than that, lack of humility, maybe, we have no idea what we have, and what about this, we have a form of godliness, we have the Bible, we have the spirit of prophecy, we have all these riches, but is it doing us any good, we have a form, but we don't have you can have, you can mentally assent to all these wonderful truths. But if it's not, if you're not experiencing it in your life, if you're not gaining victory over sin in your daily life, if you're not partaking of those riches daily, and assimilating it into your spiritual life each and every day, all those riches are not doing you one, one eye of the good. All those riches that the Lord has given to the church, if you're not partaking, if you're not assimilating, if you're not experiencing the power of God in your life, God says, you're poor, you're blind, you're naked, and your condition makes you want to. All these riches that the Lord has given to us should have prepared a people who would reflect the character of Jesus fully, who have given the gospel to the world. Christ could have come, in the sermon two weeks ago, Christ could have come multiple times before this, right? Shortly after 1844, shortly after 1888, and I dare say, several times, even in the 20th century, Christ could have come. Christ should have come. But because his people were not ready, we're still a long ways away. What does it mean to be rich in our spiritual experience? You know, there, there was a... Um, study that was undertaken at the Adventist church and says 63% um, of the Adventist uh, people in the Adventist church, of these people that they gave this questionnaire to, they said 63% answered and said, yes, I have an intimate relationship with Jesus. Another 73% said, yes, I have the assurance of salvation. Does that sound good? But then, how do people do think spent time every day with Jesus Christ. Spent a portion of their day every day with Jesus Christ. In word, in word, studying, prayer. Every day, how many, what percentage? 33%. So one third, only one third of the Adventist church, of these people, said they spend daily time with Jesus Christ. And yet, 63% said, I have an intimate relationship with Jesus. And 73% said, I have the assurance of salvation. Is this what the later seen condition is? It's exactly it, right? I am rich, increased in truth. I have needed nothing. I have the assurance of salvation. I have an intimate relationship with Jesus. But in reality, one third of the people spend time, actually spend time with Jesus Christ. You know, there's a, 
an interesting study of um, international education. Uh, they've been doing this for quite a few years, international ac academic testing. And uh, the North Americans and the um, Western European nations, their students from, uh, they, tested, they test um, grade school and high school, all through grade school and high school, the, the Americans, the Western Europeans, they score very high in their confidence levels. When you ask them, uh, are, are you confident in your math levels, in your science levels, in your language abilities? North Americans, Western Europeans come up, come up on top of them. Yes, I can, do, I, can, I can handle those subjects very well. But does the reality match their confidence? Actually not. They do pretty poorly in some of those test subjects. But in um, the actual countries that score the highest on these subjects, math and science and language and all of these, it's usually the Asian, South Asian countries that score very high in these tests. You, you ask for their confidence levels, their confidence levels are way down here. So, uh, not, I'm not that great. But their test scores put them at the top of the heap. It's kind of a, a pretty interesting uh, dichotomy that you see there, where in the Americans, the North, North Americans, and the um, Western Europeans say, yeah, I can do this. But in reality, they're way down here. Whereas the, the Asians say, ah, I'm not so good at this. But they actually score very high. Is, is having self-confidence important? Actually, it is true that if you feel, if you say to yourself, I can do this, there's a higher likelihood that you will do it, right? And it translates, actually, into, you know, um, su success later on in life. So a lot of times, you know, saying, eh, I'm, I really can't do this, I'm not so good, even though you can, just mentally saying to yourself, I can't do this, it will drag you down, right? But when you say, I can do this, you have to check with reality and say, can I really do this? And that is the state that we as Seventh-day Adventists, by and large, find ourselves in. We say, I am rich, I am increased in goods, I have need of nothing. But the reality is, you're far from that. God says, I want to vomit you out of my mouth. The assurance of salvation is a big uh, topic in, in Christianity. And many people think that, you know, if you're not sure of your salvation, uh, a, lot, a lot of times in Sunday churches, you know, people come up to you and ask, are you saved? And some of us will say, some of us will say, yes, I am saved. But Ellen White cautions us against that kind of uh, self-confidence, right? Remember what she says? If you say, you cannot say, I am saved, this side of eternity. We, we can say, we are being saved yeah. through yeah. Jesus Christ, yeah. through his blood. I am in the process of being saved. But this side of eternity, we cannot say, I am saved. 